were so captive, I haven't even said hello. <laughs> okay, thank you. We wanted to be punctual. We are also um, being honored right now. So, hi everyone. I'm Asla Hanbulut. I'm the Law Librarian of Congress. Um, welcome. We are so pleased you could join us, um, either in person or online for a moderated discussion uh, with Robert Putnam and Shailen Swami Harris concerning their book, The Upspring, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How It Can Do It Again. A limited number of copies of The Upspring will be available for purchase in the room directly behind us. Uh, this event is uh, also supporting the Library of Congress's Join in Voluntary Association in America exhibit which is located in this building in the South Gallery that I hope you'll get to visit as well. Um, the discussion will be moderated by Ryan Reft. Uh, Ryan is a historian of the modern U.S. with a focus on domestic policy and politics in our manuscripts division. He received his Ph.D. in U.S. urban history from the University of California in San Diego in 2014. He oversees collections pertaining to the law, Congress, journalism, non-government organizations, uh, LGBTQ activism, and he co-curated the 2017 exhibition Echoes of the Great War, American Experiences of World War I. His work has appeared in anthologies, academic journals, Library of Congress blogs, um, and popular media such as KCET, in Los Angeles and the Washington Post. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to Ryan. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, obviously this talk is to facilitate folks to go see the joint exhibit, which you can see upstairs to the left of the Jefferson Library. And we're here to talk about the upswing. So let me introduce the co-op is the upswing. First, Robert D. Putnam is the Malcolm Research Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the British Academy, and a past president of the American Political Science Association. In 2006, he received the Skype Prize, apologies if I've mispronounced that, the world's highest accolade for a political scientist. In 2012, then President Barack Obama awarded Putnam the National Humanities Medal, the nation's highest honor for contributions to the humanities. He has written 15 books, among them Making Democracy Work, Civic Traditions in Italy, and Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. Both are among the most cited and best-selling social science works in, the, in nearly a century, and he has consulted with several presidents, as well as prime ministers across the world. His most recent book, The Upswing, as I noted, How America Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again, is a widely praised study of 20th century American economic, social, political, and cultural trends. Shailen Romney Garrett is a celebrated author, speaker, and social entrepreneur whose work offers a fresh take on political polarization, social isolation, economic inequality, and cultural change. Her commentary has appeared in various outlets such as NPR, PBS, uh, the BBC, Time Magazine, and the New York Times. Romney Garrett holds a degree in government from Harvard University and served in the Peace Corps. She spent six years in Jordan working to catal catalyze youth social innovation there. Upon returning to us, she helped found Weave, the Social Fabric Project at the Aspen Institute with David Brooks. She is a member of the Braver Angels, Angels Scholars Council and Citizen University Civic Collaboratory. She lives with her husband and two young children in New Hampshire. And with that, I'd like to welcome you up and let's get, let's get this conversation started. Thanks for coming. Can you all hear me all right? It's an unusual pleasure for me to be speaking to you in this room, and I don't think I've ever said that in any talk I've given, because if that curtain were open, I could point you to a tree under which I stood 62 years ago. Most of you are not born. Um, with a young co-ed, that's what we, that's the term that was used for college women in those years. 
And we heard John F. Kennedy say with our own ears, ask not, right there, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I'm 82, I was then about 20, and the hairs on the back of my neck, neck are rising because I'm now, I don't look like it, but I'm now that adolescent, thinking back to how that changed my life right there. Oh, and by the way, that young co-ed is sitting right there. We've been hanging out together for the last 60 some years and so far so good. Yeah, she's a, she's a pretty neat person. Um, so I'm glad to have you here. Um, America is, as my mom would have said, in a pickle. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that, that metaphor used. America's in a pickle. We're meaning things are not in great shape. Um, and if we can go to the, the next slide here, I'll say a little bit more about what I mean by that. America, and now I'm being a, I'm a data guy. Um, I um, show data, and I will show you some data here. And if you don't like data, it's fine. Just settle back, close your eyes. And if he says anything interesting, the person next to you will nudge you, and you can look up to see what the picture looks like. Um, and uh, the division of labor between us is that I show pictures and, and data, and Shailen tells stories. That's the more interesting part of this talk, but you have to listen to the data first, because it sets the stage for this picture. And America has reached, this is what it means to be in a pickle, America today is exceptionally polarized. Unbelievably polarized. Raise your hand if that's news to you that America is very politically polarized. Right, I thought I would you would have gotten that part right. And what you may not know is there's only one period in the entire history of America in which we've been as close, as, as polarized as we are now, and that was the period 1860 to 1865. I mean, I mean that, well, that's a pretty high standard. I do not mean we're right now in the middle of a civil war, but we're damn we're darn close to that period. So we're very polarized politically. We're also, and sort of independently, very unequal. The gap between rich and poor in America has probably never been as great as it is today. I mean, that's just mathematically true, no matter how you measure it. And the, the one close exception is a period at the end of the 19th century which was called the Gilded Age. Raise your hand if you've heard the term, the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age, if you don't know quite what I'm talking about, go out to this building, actually. I think this, when was this building built? 1898? Huh? And so if you go out there in the main Jefferson, that astonishing room, you will see <laughs> literally the Gilded Age. And in that period, there was a huge gap between rich and poor, the rich folks living on the Upper East Side of New York and the poor folks living huddled in the, on the Lower East Side, some of the Lower East Side, and that's the only period in American history that comes close to being as divided as we are. It's fair to say we're now in a second Gilded Age. And separately and entirely apart from that, the data are a little, well, I had, we had to work hard to get the data for this, but the degree of social connection is at an all-time low. And the degree of social isolation and loneliness has rarely been as high as it is now. So socially, we're really fragmented and separated from one another. We barely even know our neighbors now. And last, we're in a period of exceptional cultural self-centeredness. I, 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 I. That's our culture, not we. And. So this first part is to, uh, the talk is to say, how did we get here? Statistically speaking, how did we get to? So I'm going to show you some charts and graphs. I'm going to go quickly over them um, because this is not an academic seminar. I'm, you, you better believe I would love to be asked a lot of questions about this because you can click, 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 and I will get, you can't out question me with respect to these data, but I'm not going to force it on you right now. So if we could have the next slide. I'm, we're here looking at. Um, a chart of politics in America. Um, the horizontal axis is, uh, if we can move the, the uh, laser there, the horizontal axis runs from 
1890, about 1895 is where the data begins, sort of, all the way across to today. So that's, when you look across the graph, you're looking at successive slices of American history over the last 125, 120 years. And the vertical axis is going to be some feature of American society where up is good and down is bad. So the vertical axis here is political comedy, that is bipartisanship, the degree to which we, you know, we can cooperate across party lines, and down is polarization. Is that sort of basically clear? So now you've got the picture, you can see what the history looks like. It's astonishing. It's this big inverted U curve. We start over in the 1890s. America is, the politics of America in the 1890s, well, it's a lot like the politics of America today, very tribal. And people hated people on the other side of the aisle. They never cooperated politically with people on the other side of the aisle. They certainly would not let one of their kids marry somebody from the other side of the aisle. Great political tensions. But then you can see, right, beginning about 1900, 1910, that begins to change. We're still very polarized, but we're getting a little less polarized. You see, that, and that graph shows as you go up there through the teens and 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, and now, was, remember, pause for just a second. There was a war in there in a, between 1940 and 1945, a big war in America. That boosted our sense of cooperation across party lines. But it, we kept going up even after the war. And, and we reached a peak of, of bipartisan cooperation under the aegis of a guy named Dwight Eisenhower. This is really a test. Raise your hand if you've ever even heard of Dwight Eisenhower. That's an age test. Um, and um, he was the least partisan president in American history, except for George Washington. So very, he didn't cause this, he was the consequence of this. And then we still stayed pretty, a lot of cooperation and political cooperation in that building right over there and across America, and people uh, thought it was just fine. I mean, they thought, they thought it was dumb to ask whether they cared about whether your daughter married a, a Democrat or not. I mean, that was bizarre. Um, and, but then, you know, beginning of the late 60s, I will make a confession, I uh, first voted in 1968, and there's a good cause to believe I personally triggered this, right? As soon as I started to vote, America fell into, you know, pretty awful. Um, but then down, down, this is simple, down, 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 every year, more, less and less partisan, bipartisan cooperation, right? Every year, more and more people say, I don't know, I wouldn't mind if my son married a Catholic, but I certainly wouldn't want him to marry a Democrat. And now, that, that, most Americans would rather that their child marry someone outside their religion, but God forbid, that they should marry someone outside their political party. It's bizarre. I mean, maybe it isn't to you, but for me, it's really bizarre. Okay, that's politics. And now you have the basic picture, and I'm going to be a little quicker now and show you that the same pattern show, applies to, let's go next to, this is I think, economics. The data here, the hard data began in 1913 because that's when the IRS was formed, but we do know what happened beforehand. And way off to the left, that was the Gilded Age, big gap between rich and poor income distribution of wealth or income uh, or before or after taxes. I mean, I'm, I'm shielding you from all the eight different measures of inequality that we have here. You can see that we were very unequal in when the, when the movie, when the lights come up in 1913, we're already very unequal, but we had been even more unequal before. And we were, but we started to become a little less equal, not a lot, but a little less equal. Then there's that pause in the 20s, that's the roaring 20s, that's when the stock market was going um, gangbusters and, and the working class was, you know, taking it on the chin. But then coming out of that in the late 1920s, even before the New Deal, notice that, even before the New Deal, we began moving in, other, in, in a more equal direction. Still not super equal, but, and, and now I'm just going to zip up there, we got more equal in, during World War Two, but then after World War II, we got even more equal. And when you reach the peak up there at the top, put your, the, the, at the very top, America was the most equal country in the world. You won't believe this. It's a true fact. The distribution of income and wealth in America in that period was more equal than Sweden. Socialist Sweden. We were capitalist America, but we had somehow contrived 
to like a distribution in which there weren't there not huge gaps between rich and poor. But then again, you know, you see it begins to turn down a little bit. And I won't bore you with the rest of it. It just keeps going down and down and down and down. And if we continue, the, of course, the data here ended in 2015, because that's when Shailin and I actually finished this, this research. But we know now what it would look like. And by now, put, put the, the, um, the laser point at the very, very bottom. No, 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 way down at the corner. Way down. That's where it is now. And that's why I say we are unbelievably unequal now. OK, next slide. Um, social cohesion. I, sorry, I'm an academic. I have an academic term for this, which is social capital. But if you don't, if you're not an academic, who cares what, what it's called, social capital? The question is, how do we, how much are we connected with other people? That's the, the, the underlying variable here. And it means everything from do we get married or not? You know, how, how much are in touch with our extended family are we? How well do we know our neighbors? Um, how involved are we in community projects? How, how often do we join clubs? Um, sorry, where's that? Hold up the, the book about the, uh, the, the show here. Uh, just join in. That's a, show, a great show about uh, people joining clubs. And that's another measure that fits this same, this same pattern. Uh, or trust. How much we, do we trust other people? Simple. Um, and we got lots of good measures, and they all show the same thing, this. America, at the end of the 19th century, was very distrusting. We didn't, there were, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to use politically, what is now politically incorrect language. There were many, many bachelors and old maids, people as men and women who never got married. They had a low birth rate, relatively speaking, a low birth rate. Um, they didn't know their neighbors. Shailen will maybe later on tell you why they didn't know their neighbors. They didn't know their neighbors. They didn't join anything. Um, and they didn't trust anybody. But then you can see, again, as the 20th century opened, that graph, if you can move the, the uh, razor pointer over there, it's, I know it's boring. Up, up, up. Still, we don't trust other people. Oh, but there, notice the, 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 the pause in the 20s. I don't know how to explain that, but it keeps going up, up, up into the past World War II, it wasn't, this is not just, you know, knowing our neighbors and caring about our neighbors during the war. Up, 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 until top point here is um, 1968. I, rem I remind you, you all now know what happened, what important thing happened in 1968. Putnam voted. And immediately, we began to disconnect from everybody else. And we began to trust people less. Now, you might think, well, who, you know, how do, doesn't everybody not trust other people? No. In that period, if you ask Americans, would you say that most people can be trusted? I'm doing the, don't, don't quote me on this, because I have to look, look at the book, actually, to get the exact number. But it's about 70% of Americans in that period said, most people can be trusted. Sure, of course. We don't lock our doors, etc. That figure, the last I heard, which was a couple of months ago, that figure is now 17%. Dramatic change. I mean, when I was growing up in a little town in Ohio, Port Clinton, everybody, and nobody locked their door. Everybody trusted everybody else. And now you must think they were bonkers in Port Clinton. How could they live in a place? If you live in Port Clinton, now you lock your door. So big changes here. Last, uh, I'm just about done, and I'll turn it over to you. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit long, but not too much. Um, let's go to the next slide. Oh, it happens to have the same shape. Here we're, I would love to spend an hour on this one chart because how to measure culture is a complicated thing. So I'm going to do some hand waving here, but if you have a question, be sure to ask me because I'm proud of how we measured this. This is a measure of the degree to which people feel that we're all in this together. That's up. Or, no, we're not all in it together. I'm out for me and, not, and just me. To what extent do we think of our country and our communities as you know, we're all in this together. Boats rise and fall together. Or, to what extent do we think, I'm better off if my boat rises, because that's probably going to mean that somebody else's boat goes down. And again, Shailen can tell you more about what that looked like in historical detail. I probably don't need, do I, to tell you what the graph looks like. At the beginning of this period, America was a very, I, I'm going to use this language, a very me society. Everything was focused on me. 
And when I say everything, I mean poetry and literature and art and political culture, too. And then that, it's boring now, right? That same, you see the same pattern, you can see the pause in the 20s, and then you can see it rises, and you can see it hits its peak in probably 1965 or something, and then it turns on a dime. And we, we're, it doesn't change overnight, but what changes overnight is the direction. You can see that very clearly, up and then down. And for the last, what is that now? 60, that's almost, well, we know. It happened just after we were married. Well, there's another possible causal explanation. Um, but what that, that means that almost every person in this room has never lived in America in which things were getting better. I mean, I don't mean materially. None of, almost none of you have lived in, a, in a, mer a period in which America was becoming more trusting and more had a sense that we're all in this together. This is not just something that happened some people think it's related to a recent president that I won't name, but that somehow he brought this on. It's, he's a symptom of this. He that will go unnamed. You know what I mean? He can't possibly have caused this. He was hardly even born when this trend started. So this is a bigger deal. It's at the core of contemporary American politics. It's what we're fighting about over there all the time. But it isn't driven by something as superficial as day-to-day -day politics. Does that make sense? So I'm going to put all these together, and then I'm going to turn it over to Shailen. If we put them all together, next slide. This is America. That, that is all I've told you. The last, the, this 125 years has been America's I, we, I century. In many, many, ex there are many, many data, data points that show exactly that trend. So what was going on there? Sheila? So we're not the first researchers to spot the downturn, right? There's been a lot of commentary about how America has been on a downward slide for a number of decades. Um, in fact, one reviewer, one early reviewer of our book said, this is just another contribution to the how America got into this mess genre of literature. Apparently, there's a whole genre now. Um, but what I think makes this discovery different is a couple of things. One, it's hard to stress. I mean, Bob is the, is the data scientist, but he will back me up on this for sure. It's hard to overstate how rare it is to find this many different data points following the same trajectory over such a long period of time. Because you have to understand that each of the curves that Bob showed you represents scores of underlying measures. So when we're talking about political polarization, we're measuring political polarization in 15 different ways and combining those into one curve. So underneath each of these curves, we're talking about scores and scores of different measures of American life, all of which chart the same path, not for a year, not for 10 years, but for 125 years of our history, which means that there's something going on here. But what is going on here? A lot of people would look at this curve, this I, we, I century story, and say, yeah, we need to get back to that time, that supposed halcyon period in American history when everything was better. We need to make America great again, right? Because looking only at this downturn can produce some nostalgia for a, a time gone by when things were supposedly better. So I want to be clear that that's not the message of our book nor is that the message that I want to leave with you today because of a couple of things. First of all, we know that that peak of American we that we see in the 1960s was problematic in some pretty serious ways, right? And we will be able to, to touch on that a bit more later, I hope. But the other problem with that is it turns out not to be very instructive given the problems that we're facing today. We feel that if ever there's a period of history whose lessons we need to learn, it's not the period when we were supposedly at the peak of we, but rather the period that looked the most like the one we're living through today, which, as we see clearly from the data, turns out to be the Gilded Age. By hard measures across scores of different parts of our society, we are living through a second American Gilded Age. 
That's been said a lot by commentators, and usually they're referring just to the economic inequality portion of this story, but it turns out that the phenomenon is deeper and broader than we ever thought before. So rewinding the story back to the Gilded Age, there were a lot of people who were pretty concerned about the future of America back in the 1890s. Plutocracy, tyranny, oligarchy, the American experiment has gone off the rails. These were all things that were being talked about in popular publications, in the press. But we now know, looking backward, that, that those doomsday prophecies were never fulfilled. The American experiment didn't fail. Democracy didn't go off the rails. On the contrary, we entered a multifaceted, multi-decade upswing. We turned everything around, and that upswing didn't just last for a minute, it lasted for 70 years. So the question is, how did they do that? How did we do it once before? Because this data shows in a crystal clear way that we have been in a mess just as deep, just as multifaceted, just as challenging as the one that we are living through today. We got ourselves out of it once before, and we can do it again. So the question is how? If we can go to the next slide, we have a few lessons that we want to share with you from this period of history, the period when the American Gilded Age gave way to the progressive era. That was when we turned our downturn into an upswing. Now, before I go on to this, I want to just pause and say, when we use the term progressive in this context, we are talking about capital P progressivism. So for the historians in the room, you'll know that progressivism, as it's referring to this period just after the Gilded Age, is distinct from the term that I would call lowercase p progressivism. And small p progressivism is usually how we hear the term used today. That refers to the leftmost end of the political spectrum, right? But capital P progressivism was something very different. It was a movement, a bipartisan movement that was so diverse as to be barely coherent. It included people from both sides of the political aisle, it included all sorts of different members of society. It was a really broad, widespread movement. So when we talk about the progressives, we're not talking about progressives as they look today. I wanna to make sure that that's clear. But who were these progressives and what did they do? And what can we learn from their story? Well, let's pause for a minute and just remember that the story that we came here to tell you is a fundamentally data-based story. It's a story that comes out of a study of trends over time. So when you have a lot of different trends over time that follow the same trajectory, particularly when those trends start to turn in the same direction at the same time, you might ask yourself, well, which of them turned first? What is what statisticians call the leading variable? Which thing turned first? Because if we could figure that out, maybe we would have some clue as to what we should focus on first in order to get all these facets of our society moving back in the right direction. And we tend to have a little bit of a bias in this country. Uh, we tend to think that economics drives everything. And that comes a little bit out of the social sciences, where individuals are often treated like economic animals, driven by incentives, right? And so you might think, well, of course, the leading indicator here was economics, that we started to fix our economic inequality, and then suddenly that made us all feel like we were all on the same page, and that we were all part of the same project, and that brought us together, and that fixed everything. Turns out, interestingly, that very clearly from the data, that is not the case. That economics was the lagging indicator. It was the thing that moved in the right direction last. Now, that does not mean that we should not focus on fixing our economic inequality. That is an urgent and deep and difficult problem that needs a solution in this country. However, what we might be learning from the last upswing is that there might be something underneath the economic policies or the question of economic distribution that has to shift first before those other things will begin to move. So if economics was the lagging indicator, then what was the leading indicator? What did shift first? This is a little bit hard to tell. We have to be a little bit transparent here because we're looking at scores of different measures and we're looking really far back in the, in the past when it comes to data collection, right? So you can liken this a little bit to like a flock of birds in flight and you're standing a thousand feet down on the ground and you see them moving in one direction and then all of a sudden they shift and move in a different direction. You've seen that happen before. And from your vantage point, it's really hard to tell which of those birds was the leader. We're facing a similar sort of problem with this data. 
But when we pair the data that we have with the historical record, what emerges is a very clear picture that what changed first was our morality, our cultural narratives. First and foremost, the upswing was about a moral and cultural awakening. Before we fixed our economic policies, before we began to come together in our communities, we began to change the way that we saw each other, the way that we talked about what this country was all about. Now, the Gilded Age uh, was a time in American history from a cultural perspective that was characterized by something called social Darwinism. In a period just previous to this, Charles Darwin had articulated a theory about how the natural world is organized. And that theory came to be called the survival of the fittest. Basically, that the natural world is one giant competition and only the strong will survive. And so a lot of social commentators heard that theory and they said, huh, well, if that's the way the natural world is organized, then that's the way society should be organized. It's just one giant competition and it's every man for himself. And that was what social Darwinism was. Now, it's important to note that Darwin himself didn't really subscribe to this but many Americans did. And what that looked like was a really cutthroat competition ethos in our culture. And into that cultural milieu came a group of reformers called the social gospel movement. This initially came out of evangelical Protestantism as a way of looking at the theology and the practice of Christianity and saying, hey, we're not living up to our own values. This is not what Jesus would do. In fact, the term, what would Jesus do? comes from a best-selling 1899 novel that was aimed at calling America to repentance for the gross economic inequality of the day. These social gospel preachers began to remind Americans what this nation was all about. It wasn't just about competition. It was about coming together to achieve something together. And this movement started in, in Christianity, but eventually took hold more broadly in society, and we began to have a moral awakening as a society. Now, when you have a moral awakening or like a moral outrage situation, that can take a couple of different forms, right? We can start to point the finger and say it's those people and those people and those people who have ruined America, and if we can just get them out of the picture, then we'll, the rest of us are going to all be fine. Does that sound a little bit familiar? But there's another way that we can go about this, which is to direct the moral indignation inward. In fact, the historian Richard Hofstadter described the progressive era as a phenomenon of moral indignation directed inward. People began to recognize their own complicity in the systems that had created these problems and they began to choose to do things differently. And that moral shift changed our politics, it changed our communities, it changed everything about this nation for 70 years. So one thing that we know, if we want to see another upswing today, we need to begin to talk about our culture and our morality and how that is the basis of what is going to change the way we see ourselves. Another thing that we know is that this movement was driven by young people. The Jane Addamses and the Francis Perkinses and, and the founders of all these incredible movements that were part of the progressive era were doing their most energizing and energized work when they were under the age of 30. This is because they were living in an entirely changed world from the one that their parents had lived in. Their parents had grown up on farms and in small towns, attending quilting bees and Bible studies and barn raisings. And that stuff just wasn't going to cut it on the Lower East Side of New York for the millions of people who had migrated into the cities as the result of the Industrial Revolution. And so these young people knew that they had to invent a new way to live together and a new way to do democracy. And they did it, just like today. Are we living in a changed world from the one that our parents were living in? Absolutely, changed in very different ways, but it's a, it's a whole different moment that requires a youthful energy just as the progressive era did. We also know that the progressives prioritized associations. Again, going back to that exhibit, right? If you wanna see how they prioritized getting together, joining, associating, go see the exhibit and you can see the multiplicity of ways, the huge civic boom that happened during the Progressive Era when Americans invented new ways of being together. They founded Rotary Clubs and, and, and Lions Clubs and all sorts of different associations that were fit for a changed world. And they began to knit together again what had become an unraveled social fabric. 
So if we're going to see our social fabric come back again, if we are going to enter another upswing, it's gonna have to have association, bringing people together, particularly people across lines of difference at the absolute core of what we're doing. Another important lesson of this was that it was a grassroots movement. Sometimes if you've studied the progressive era in high school or in college, you might associate it with all these big national programs, the national income tax, child labor legislation, trust busting, all these things that happened at the national level, right? But the truth of the story is that all of that stuff was the caboose. The energy and the ideas came at the grassroots. They started at the very local level with people tinkering in the laboratories of democracy, fixing problems right on their own doorsteps, making solutions that transcended the gridlocked left-right political framework and bubbled up and went viral to change the face of the nation. Similarly, there was no charismatic leader who said, we're gonna start a progressive era and this is what it's gonna look like. Teddy Roosevelt is often cast as that character in this story, but the truth is that he saw the parade and got out in front of it. This was happening well before he stepped onto the political national stage. He really just saw a movement happening in this country and he became the articulator of what this would look like in our national politics. So there's not gonna be some national charismatic leader who's gonna save us. We're gonna have to save ourselves by starting right where we are just as they did then. Now, I've shared a lot of positive lessons about these great progressives and how they saved America, but the truth is that not all the lessons from this era are positive. There are many cautionary tales as well. Because the truth is that the circle of moral concern that the, the progressives created with this moral awakening simply did not extend to people of color, and to a certain extent not to women and to other marginalized groups in this country, right? essentially most of the progressives were, not all of them, but many of them were racist. And so a lot of the programs and the policies and the things that they created, created this legacy now of structural racism that we are now reckoning with. So it is, is indisputable that they moved America in this incredible upswing direction, but they did so in a highly racialized way, which becomes a really important part of the story of the downturn, which hopefully we can get to in a little bit. There are other cautionary tales from this era, but I need, to, I need to open it up to questions so that we can have a discussion together. So I encourage you, if you're curious about this, to read the book um, and see a little bit more about, about the multifaceted uh, lessons we can learn from the progressive era. But these are just a few things that if we're looking to create another upswing today, that we should learn from history. If we can just go to the next slide, I'll leave you with this thought. Teddy Roosevelt, who became one of the most articulate champions of the progressive movement, said this, the fundamental rule of our national life, the rule which underlies all others, is that in the, on the whole and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. This is more than just a lovely sentiment. The data show this is really clear. This is a fact of how the last 125 years have, have borne out in our history. This is how it works. We all do better when we all do better. If we want to see another upswing in our country, we are going to have to find a way to come together as a we again. I believe that we can do it because we've done it once before. It isn't gonna be easy, it wasn't easy then, and it wasn't an overnight switch. It took 70 years to bear out. But we have to do it, nothing less then the success of the American experiment hangs in the balance. We've done it once before and we can do it again and that's what we're here to talk with you about today. Thank you so much for inviting us to be here. We're looking forward to hearing some questions. <clears throat> And uh, we're going to start with a discussion here, and then afterwards we'll open the discussion up to everyone in the audience, okay? Um, and just a little soft promotion, the Teddy Roosevelt papers are actually in the manuscript division, in the Madison, and online, so if you want to check them out, you can do that. So we're going to start, Bob, we'll start with you, since uh, we just heard uh, from you, Shailen. Typically, as a 20th century historian, we treat World War II as the pivot, the key kind of event of the 20th century. However, in this book, you're kind of reformulating, saying that the 1960 is kind of the pivot point. What does that do to our view of the last 125 years of America if we look at it that way? And what effect, if any, 
did the Second World War have on the move towards solidarity that you described in the first half of the 20th century? <coughs> I venture to say I'm the only person in the room who actually does remember. I was tiny, but at, by the end of the war, I was born in 1941, so by the end of the war, um, I helped um, collect um, tin cans, which was part of the way in which everybody was supposed to be involved in the war. It was part of that togetherness. Um, and World War II is the pivot of the 20th century from one very specific point of view. It, it's very important, but it's not the one we're talking about, and that is internationally. Internationally, World War II is the pivot between a period in which America was fundamentally isolationist and wanted to stay away from involvement in the rest of the world, and World War II, which we did until really Pearl Harbor, and but the deaths of that war taught most Americans, and that's still what we're, that's the, we're in the post-World War II period, or post Pearl Harbor world, world now, basically, in which most people think we can't step away into isolationism. Now, there are voices in America who think we could step away into isolation, but they are, for so far, the minority view. So, from that point of view, from that global perspective, World War II was a, was a pivot point. But, as you know, well, I'm not talking about the, um, we're not talking about international relations, we're talking about domestic American politics and domestic American economics and domestic American society and culture. And the first thing I have to say is you just look at those slides. I tried to mention this as we went in passing through them. We didn't reach our, World War II was not a peak in equality. It was a peak, I mean, we kids and everybody else sort of thought we're all in this together, but that wasn't the peak of it. It kept going up for 25 years afterwards. You remember, I began this talk by telling you about this talk that I heard out here. John Kennedy's Ask Not talk. At that point in American history, what he said did not sound bizarre. It sounded like actually normal to people. I mean, it seemed, because the people who were listening to him were the World War II generation, and they thought, that's right, we worked together, we collaborated, we did not differentiate between rich and poor and so on, and we should keep going. And frankly, at that point, it sounded like a clarion call, reveille, right? We did this in World War II, we're doing it now, and we're going to get even better. We're going to send men to the moon, and we're going to start, at last, we're going to address those issues of racial inequality and so on. But if you look at these graphs, all of these graphs, you can see he was not sounding reveille. That was taps. That was taps for an end of a period, which almost immediately after, and after he was shot, I would say, and then we can talk then about what was the role of the Kennedy assassination, but almost immediately after that point, we began going down. So the downturn did not come, I mean, the peak is not World War II. That's the first thing I want to say. The peak, unequivocally across every one of these measures, the peak is the middle 60s. Um, historians know that, that much of the 60s actually happened in the 70s. Um, because the first half of the 60s, the, this, I'm, now, this, I'm now just saying what most historians of the 60s say. The first half of the 60s was a kind of good 60s. That was the 60s, the Kumbaya 60s. It was the communes 60s. It was, the, frankly, the, the first half of, of uh, LBJ's the 60s, in which we were finally coming to grips with all these problems of inequality. And it was, a, and we were, that we're coming to grips with inequality in, not only in class terms, but also in racial terms and gender terms. That was the first half of the 60s. But the second half of the 60s, which begins, roughly speaking, when almost the moment that Rosemary and I were out here on, this, on the lawn, that's why I'm so vividly aware of this, um, was a turn into um, this long, long downturn. Uh, Todd Gitlin, who, uh, Gitlin, who's the leading historian of the 60s, captures this in the title of his most important book, which is Years of Hope, Days of Rage. 
years of hope, days of rage. And Tom Wolfe coined the term about the 19th century, by as early as 1971, Tom Wolfe said, hey, we're in the, what he called the me decade. So it wasn't just us that noted this change. Now, a question to ask is, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the 60s, and if I say too much about the 60s, you interrupt me, but that's, you asked me to say what I think that, what role, at least I thought that you did, what role did the 60s play in this? Um, a game to play, I can, I've played with audiences and I won't hear. What do you think started the turn down, or what caused the turn down? And if you're pretty old, if you're now in your 70s, you're likely to say, it was all started by the assassinations. The, the, and, and if you're that age, you know what I mean by the assassinations. It was the, it was the um, Kennedy, the two Kennedy assassinations and the Martin Luther King assassination. And those all happened in 63, 64. Um, but, but then there was Vietnam, and many people think of Vietnam. Vietnam was an important part of it. It was not, it was the, it was not the only part. Independent of that, there were the, all the student upheavals. And the student upheavals, in the end, turned on, turned about, turned, became involved in Vietnam. But the student upheavals, there's, a, I mean, I remember the 60s very well. The student upheavals began before the Vietnam crisis uh, came. And then there were urban riots and the civil rights movement and just kind of nihilistic violence. We're just now hearing about the people who died, the Manson killers. That wasn't related to Vietnam, and it wasn't related to civil liberties, and it was not related to women's rights. It was itself an independent. And then there was the pill. And the pill didn't have anything to do with it. Sorry, do you even know what I mean by Well, sure, we all know what I mean by the pill, because now it's back in, you know, on the front pages, right? But when the pill was invented, that caused a sexual revolution that changed overnight. Unbelievable change. I'm a data person, right? So the fraction of all Americans who said it was okay to have sex, uh, to have sex before marriage changed from in, let me see if I get these exactly. It's in the book, so you'll have, I'm gonna get it approximately right. In, in 1964, eight, um, 75, 80, 75 to 80% of Americans said Sex before marriage is a no-no. Four years later, 30% of marriage, Americans said sex was a no-no. I don't know if I can convey to you, that is an enormous change in a very fundamental norm. And then there was a drug epidemic, and then there was Nixon and Watergate and stagflation and the oil embargoes, and I'm telling you a lot about things that none of you actually remember. What I'm trying to say is the 60s was not a single thing. There was no single thing that caused it. America had a nervous breakdown, but you can see in all these graphs how that concatenation of forces happened, and it even happened in pop music. In order to write this book, I spent two months doing nothing but listening to pop music. Um, and so, for example, in the 1965, think of the dates carefully, there was a famous Newport Film Festival in which Bob Dylan, uh, famously, the first half if you're not interested in popular music, just turn off what I'm saying now, but if you are, it's really neat. The first half of this, I think it was June of 65, the first half of the concert was the old, you know, Bob Dylan and Joan Baez in the Kumbaya 60s, and, the, and it was a, uh, an actual guitar. Then he went off stage, everybody loved it, of course. Then he went off stage and he came back in. The second half was the acoustic Bob Dylan, which is cranky, I mean, not cranky, Crashy, and and the people then at the time thought it was terrible. But of course, what he was doing was he was announcing, in that one moment, the move from this kumbaya to a more contentious. And and uh, forgive me, I just will. I would love to do this. I won't fill it up. I happen to be a Beatles fan, and this is in the history of the Beatles. The first half of the Beatles up until 1970 is all about all I need, all you need is love and I get by with a little help of my friends and it was all this wonderful. That's actually, I remember that and I love that music, that Beatles music. But then the pivot came, the pivot in, in the Beatles music comes. In 1970, um, between, I, I, I can almost get these dates right, March of 1970, uh, George Harrison pens 
the last song the Beatles ever sang together. And I'm going to, I'm going to recite for you the lyrics, all the lyrics of that last Beatles together. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. I, me, mine. Dot, dot, dot. That's the whole lyrics. I, me, mine. He was angry about it, but he was capturing what was happening in America and to the Beatles themselves, everybody focusing on I, me, mine. And um, George Lennon, six months later, responded to that with his first single um, in which, and I'm not going to try to sing any of these, but the, the, this is the lyric from that first Lennon single. I don't believe in Beatles. I just believe in me. What am I trying to say here? This was a very thoroughgoing, cultural, it, it affected all aspects of our lives. I don't know what caused it. Um, it wasn't economics for sure. It has something deeply to do with the, the shock of this period. And so once you see that from, once you, I, I think at least, when I, when I could see in, and I haven't begun to talk about the, uh, you know, serious music, Broadway music and and serious, you know, music by serious composers and literature and so on. This was a very thoroughgoing break, pivot in American society. I don't mean that everything changed in the 60s, but a hell of a lot changed in the 60s. And not just the stuff like politics and and economics and so on. You may not agree with with that, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Sure. <laughs> Shailen, kind of building off that mm -hmm. response, mm -hmm. uh, you note that for both the civil rights movement and the feminist movements, many of the most important games were, actually, games were actually made before 1970, despite the fact we often think of the 70s and the late 60s as kind of, maybe not the high point for civil rights, but certainly for feminism. And then what followed afterwards, if not retrenchment, would be described perhaps as stasis or very little movement yeah. um, in, in comparison. How does this square with the stark realities of segregation and other forms of exclusion that characterize the first two thirds of the 20th century? So I guess ultimately, can we really call that we period an era of progress toward racial equality? Yeah, that's, that's a great question and, and probably the most important question with regard to a thesis that says the first two thirds of the 20th century were all about moving toward we, right? Um, and, and, it is interesting because when we look at the, the story where it begins, where we began the story, which was in the 1890s, this was a period that was incredibly bleak from the perspective of race relations. Um, in the wake of the Civil, uh, excuse me, in the wake of the Civil War, um, we had Reconstruction and there were very rapid gains on the part of African Americans during this time that then quickly reversed uh, due to the project of um, Basically, white Southerners reclaiming hegemony in the wake of uh, Reconstruction. So there was a lot, of, a lot of quick and important gains for African Americans that were completely reversed. And so when we're looking at the turn of the 20th century, this was a particularly dark time um, in American history from the perspective of black-white racial relations, right? Um, and so there, uh, and, then, and then, you know, the, the legacy of that reclaiming of white hegemony in the South becomes Jim Crow, that then is not, a, not just a reality in the South, that's a reality in the North as well. And, and so, you know, how does that square with this story of kumbaya and, and we and, and all of this sort of thing? Well, um, it's interesting because in, we looked at tons of data, of course, over the same 125 year period with respect to this question. Of, of were we moving toward more racial equality or not during the same period and when. And there were some surprises. Um, I think that, we, that particularly white Americans tend to have this sort of cartoon history of race relations in the United States um, during the 20th century, which is basically that, that what you indicated, that sort of it was all bleak and no progress at all and all oppression and inequality. And then there was this sort of lightning bolt change in the 1950s and 60s in the wake of the Civil Rights Revolution. And that actually turns out to be true for some measures. If you wanna just go ahead one slide, we actually prepared a couple of um, slides about this, uh, this particular question. So for example, this is 
what we might call sort of a hockey stick, as opposed to what we were looking at before, which were these inverted U curves. Things got better and better and better, and then worse and worse and worse, right? Over this same period, there are some ways in which, particularly measures of inclusion versus exclusion, so this would be things like um, um, admitting admittance to you know, graduate schools or college or the ability to have representation in politics, these sorts of things, there really was very little change over the first two-thirds of the 20th century. But that turns out not to be true for other measures, which is really interesting. Um, when we look at the next slide, what we can see is this is an index of black-white material equality. So we're comparing the material well-being of blacks versus whites. And the reason that we're only doing black versus white is because we're looking at longitudinal data sets over this 125-year period, and we don't actually have this data for other peoples of color or other marginalized groups over this entire period. So it's really hard to present data about those groups over this particular period of time because of the way that census data was collected and other things. Um, so th this is why this is a focused discussion about black versus white. And if you look at this graph, what you're gonna see is at the very top you see 1.0. That would be complete equality between the races. And we're talking about things like distribution of income, we're talking about life expectancy, we're talking about infant mortality, we're talking about educational attainment, we're talking about all kinds of different measures of well-being all income. combined here. Income, home ownership, wealth, right? And what you can see fascinatingly, which is what you pointed out, we've never gotten anywhere close to equality, which is no surprise. But the majority of the movement toward equality actually happened before the 1970s, which is a story that most white Americans are not familiar with. Um, but most black Americans are, mostly because the, the majority of that progress was driven by something called the Great Migration. So the mass exodus of black Americans out of the South and into the more hospitable West and North actually created a lot of um, movement toward equality essentially um, a sort of a, a vast self-help movement. This wasn't because well, white America see. all you know, came together and said, let's all you know, like make everything equal, right? Not at all. But it is fascinating that right at that turn, when we started moving from we and then back down to I, we see what? You would have thought that in the wake of that civil rights movement, it's no surprise that the civil rights legislation passes at the peak of the I, we, I curve, because finally we've sort of widened the circle of we and we're starting to feel ready to do this on a racial, you know, on racial terms and we pass this legislation, but then what happens? Literally weeks after, so, so the majority of white Americans were in support of civil rights legislation passing. Within weeks, however, the survey data shows that white Americans were not interested in implementing those newly passed pieces of legislation. It was a not in my backyard. It's all fine and good as a concept, but let's not actually do anything about it. So there was this huge backlash to the civil rights movement, and whether that caused this broader turn toward I, or whether the broader turn toward I and self-centeredness caused this backlash uh, of, uh, you know, this racial backlash, we can't say for sure, but we do know that those two phenomena are deeply intertwined, and the result has been just in the moment when you, sh you would have expected this graph to keep rising, because the civil rights movement just achieved all of these gains, you would have thought that we would have been moving toward full equality. In fact, we stagnate, and no progress is made. And so when we look at things like the Black Lives Matter movement, one of the biggest you know, stories that that movement was trying to tell was nothing has changed in these neighborhoods since the 1960s. And that's exactly what this data says. And a huge reason for that, we believe, is because of the broader cultural turn toward looking out for number one. It doesn't matter what you, know, you guys are experiencing or doing, it's all about me and what's best for me, what's best for my kids and my neighborhood, right? And so what you know is that a movement toward we culturally speaking, is more hospitable to creating equality between the races than a cultural moment of I. It's not sufficient, though. I believe that, that in, in large measure, what happened with, with the white backlash to the civil rights movement was simply that we had done the legislative work of repairing our racial inequalities in this country, but we, had not, we hadn't done the heart work the work underneath, the work inside of ourselves to actually come into human community with people unlike ourselves. And that work remains undone today. 
not just for, you know, between blacks and whites, but between all sorts of different groups in this country. That is work that we have not done. And so if we want to see any upswing today, we can't just kick the racial question down the road the way that the progressives did. They said, you know, we can have progress, but not for everyone. And how many times have the needs of people of color or other groups been sacrificed on the altar of progress? We can't do that right now, because if we do that right now, then the rest of this other stuff won't happen. So we just, you know, we'll get around to that. That can't happen again, because in many ways, the upswing had knit into it its own demise. And so that's a huge part of the story of what we saw with the upswing and then the downturn. It was, it was inextricably linked to race in this country. Thank you. One thing we haven't really touched on, although, Bob, I suppose you touched on it a bit when you talked about the popular culture of music, was media. Obviously, in the second half of the 20th century, we've moved from uh, a part of the century arguably dominated by media that was more centralizing, uh, network television, radio, even organizationally corporate America. And now we're in an era that many observers have defined by fragmentation. Social media, there's the breakdown of Twitter, for one example, and the various sure. other apps that are popping up could just be a, a current example, the decline of network television, the rise of streaming, and other examples of that kind of fragmentation. If Marshall McLuhan uh, famously quipped, medium is the message, are we being shaped by the medium? Is this, this change in media the explanation for our fractures or dissolution? Uh, what role has the rise of social media had in fueling our descent into what you both call the culture of I? Great question, tough question. Uh, yeah. Can I take the next one? I'd rather have <laughs> window B, which is a, no, I'm joking. Um, Pass. <laughs> but if, uh, what I would like is if you can go back to the basic I we I curve. Uh, yeah, right yeah, there. Okay. Um, forgive me, I'm just going to stand up for a minute. <clears throat> um, in 2000, can you see where 2000 is on the chart? Well down the curve. Um, I published a book called Bowling Alone. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of the book called Bowling Alone. Oh, good, great. Well, it was a book. You know what that book was about. Basically, it was one of these four strands. When I wrote it, I didn't know anything about it, kind of economics and philosophy and all that kind of stuff. But I did know about um, social connections. And I, starting around 2000, I said, it looks to me like we've had a decline in, in, um, so in social connections in America. And at the very moment that I published that book, um, the internet came into existence, actually. It's hard to believe that it was that recent. But indeed, um, social networks had not been invented when I, when I wrote that book. They were, um, uh, Facebook was invented basically um, in one of my classes. No, it was invented at Harvard by um, Zuckerberg and some friends um, in, in 2006. Okay, so now, when I, when after the appearance, the first, and of course, uh, I know very well that um, uh, Facebook is no longer the only social media site, of course not. But once the social media began to take off. Everybody said, not everybody, but a lot of people said, who cares about bowling leagues? We can go to Facebook, it's just as good. In other words, you, you see what I'm trying to speak elliptically here, but to make an analytic point, that we don't need face-to-face -face connections, which is what I've been showing had been declining. That's fine, but just in time, over the hill come the cavalry, the technological cavalry, and they invent completely new ways of connecting that don't involve face-to-face -face connections, but just involved in clicking, you know, clicking a button on your, on your mouse. And so the question, this is not the only question you're asking, but it's one of the questions, which is, can TikTok or Facebook or you name your, you know, your, your social media, can that replace bowling teams? And you, you see what I mean? I'm not, I literally don't mean literally bowling teams, but can these electronic connections replace the obviously, nobody th denies that the face-to-face -face ties are declining. And so that debate began about uh, in the first decade of the 21st 
century. And, um, and there was a great, it's hard to now remember, there was a great um, cyber euphoria in those years. And we talk a little bit about this in, in, in our new book. It's on, now, if you read those things, it's just amazing. People said it's going to cause universal peace to break out because we're all going to be able to have the same, you know, we're all going to be loving each other on Facebook and so on. I mean, it's just amazing to have what people said. It never seemed to me that was quite true. But for, and, and, there, and the research, actually, on whether Facebook was better or worse than bowling leagues um, actually began to show that, it, that Facebook was not as good as bowling leagues. Let me just give you, I'm, I got, I'm sorry, I'm a data guy, so I want to give you a, a quick graph. I'm going to do it with my hands. It turns out that your life expectancy depends on how many friends you have. That's a true fact. That's well demonstrated. I mean, that is not actually, if we had, I wish we had the surgeon, the most recent surgeon general, well, no, the, certain, the current surgeon general in the room now because he makes a big deal about loneliness and he will tell you that being socially isolated is a terrible thing. And um, so there's a graph you can draw of how long you're going to live depending upon how many friends you have, a real graph. And it looks like, so okay, are you with me doing a, a, a little? So here's the graph. Um, zero friends, you're, you know, not well off. You don't, you know, you ought to make sure your life insurance is paid up. Having one friend increases a lot your chances, your, reduces your chances of dying, or actually cuts your chances of dying in half over the next year. So one, zero to one is up. And, zero to, and one to two is up. And two to three is up. And that keeps going until the, your 19th friend adds to your life expectancy. It's amazing. Your 20th friend, well, okay, that's getting a little too much. But it, that, that trend looks like that. It doesn't level off until 20 friends. Now I'm going to show you the same graph exactly for your life expectancy depending upon the number of Facebook friends you have. I will show you that. Um, Zero Facebook friends, here you are. Adding one Facebook friends, you're still at the same level. Adding 12 Facebook friends, you're still at the same level. Adding 500 Facebook friends, you're still at that same level. It's had zero effect on your life expectancy. I rest my case. I mean, I'm not going to stop. But that's, in very real terms, face-to-face -face connections are not the same as, um, as uh, electronic connections. And the, the, the academics had, there's, there's mixed evidence, as there always is on things like this, but the academics had by, um, by 2020, more or less agreed on that, although there was a lot of still, most people thought that, to go back to my original metaphor, um, Facebook was better than bowling leagues. That all changed in, I can tell you the date on which that Consensus changed. It was thir uh, it was Thursday, November twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. Thanksgiving, and everybody in America realized that hugging grandma was different from zooming with grandma. Believe me, we knew that, and everybody did. And what the what the COVID did? It did a lot of things, of course. But one of the things it did is it brought home the costs or the inadequacies. Of, 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 of uh, electronic connections. And, and now, actually, there's a lot, there's beginning, after the fact, we're getting a, a lot of evidence about that. I do not mean, I'm trying to simplify a little bit here so that I don't spend the next hour giving you a lit review about all the literature on both sides of this question, but I think that technology is a less universal driver or media technology, is a less universal driver of social patterns than many people think. I don't mean to be including you necessarily in that, but it's, um, to some extent, we get the media we deserve, and to some extent, we tend to, many people tend to overestimate the media, the effects of media. I'll give you one example. We all think that the internet is a big deal. Well, it is a big deal, but it's nowhere near as big a deal as the telephone. The telephone 
meant that for the first time in human life, you could talk to someone who was not within the sound of your voice. Right? Think about it. That's a huge deal. Our whole life as a species, the only way you communicate to somebody is actually to be in their presence. And the telephone says, nope, you can talk to people. And people then, just like people now, had these amazing views about how that was going to transform American society. Because it was going to allow, um, I'm almost quoting from those, that literature in those years, this is when the telephone is in the same stage that we are now in the internet, uh, it's going to be marvelous, it's going to bring world peace, same predictions, um, and moreover, there's not going to be any difference between our, us, our connections to our next door neighbors, and people on the other side of the world. That turned out to be completely untrue. It, it turned out to be that the closer someone was to you physically, the more you telephoned with them. And that, by the way, is true now. I have lots of email all the time. We're doing email and so on, but who, who is, where is the person sitting who I send most of my emails to? She's sitting right there, and in our home, she's sitting in the next door, next room. Ask yourself, how many of your emails go to somebody that you know and who's close to you? Okay, I'm... I'm but I want to make really one final point, two final points. One, do you all know what an alloy is? An alloy is a mixture of two metals, two base metals, two elements. You put them together, and you get some alloy, and then you stir it up, and you heat it, and so on. And it has properties different from either of the other two. So you, I never remember which it is, but you put brass and tin together, and you get... I don't know, bronze or something. It's different from the other two, right? Okay, keep in mind the idea of an alloy. Most of our connections, most of our network connections, yours and mine and hers and yours, all of us, are simultaneously face-to-face -face and electronic. Almost none of us communicate electronically with people we don't know. In fact, most of the time, the people we meet are people, I mean, face-to-face -face are people that we also are very, uh, we're, we're, we're connected with them all the time electronically. Therefore, it's a mistake to ask, what's the effect of this brand new technology, um, you know, electronic connections, social networks, compare that with, with old-fashioned face-to-face networks, because that nobody in the world has, oh, I shouldn't say nobody, nobody in America has that kind of two separate things. We have an alloy. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Raise, you under, raise your hand if you understand what I mean, that we now communicate by alloys. That is mixtures, all the time, mixtures. So the real question is not which is better, this or that, which is better, bronze or tin, brass or tin, but what's the nature of the alloy? And some alloys could be particularly good for building real community. And this is the point I wanted to get to. We have agency. I'm sorry, agency is a highfalutin, academic sounding term, which means we can decide what kind of technology we get. What do I mean by that? We could develop Facebook, and Facebook knows this. Mark Zuckerberg knows this. I know that because I was out at Facebook headquarters and talked to their, they know that they could set up Facebook so that it made it easy to connect with people that you actually are close to. They, they know that they could set up Facebook so that it diminished polarization. And they know that they, could, so that's one kind of alloy. They know they could do another kind of alloy which doesn't help people meet face to face and doesn't encourage them to you know, help their, their longevity and so on. And that they know that they could create a Facebook that increases polarization, and which of those two things do you think they've chosen to do? This is not just me. What was the name of the whistleblower who testified before the internal whistleblower? I give her what? Francis Haugen. Pardon? Francis Haugen. Francis Haugen. She was saying she saw the same data I did. They chose to make the alloy that is bad for our connections. So, bottom line here. And I know I've gone on along, but I was trying to make this point deeply. We, both the companies out there on the West Coast and we in our usage, can choose. Do we want an Internet that will bring us closer together with other real people, or do we want an Internet that will divide us? 
That is, in my view, the biggest question. Don't think of technology as something out there that's controlling us. Think of technology as something we could control and we could make America better or if we make the wrong choices, we could make America worse. I'm sorry I went on so long. Yeah, no problem. We're going to finish with a slightly philosophical question and then we'll open it up to the floor. Shailen, many people view history uh, as a linear march toward progress. Uh, if you've ever been to grad school for history, they tell you not to do that, um, <laughs> but people do. But your book argues actually it's not. Rather, that there are periods of progress and regression, so you know, advancement, retrenchment. How does this affect how we see our history, and how does it affect? How did it affect when you guys put this book together? Yeah, great question. Because there is a way that you could look at this graph, just the graph, and say, oh, well, this is kind of a story of a pendulum, right? That we sort of that there's natural flow to history, that we have periods where we're really narcissistic, but then that reaches its sort of apex and then we naturally, sort of the gravity swings us back toward togetherness. And then that gets to be too much and too stuffy. And in the 50s, we hear all of this, you know, decrying conformity and, and you know, and, and that reaches its sort of natural apex. And then we swing back again toward, toward individualism, right? And that is a view that you could take of this story. It, it, right? Um, I think fundamentally what we believe is what Bob just said, which is that this is a story about choice more than anything. And I, I actually believe that history is a story about choice, right? Both individual choice and collective choice um, in the sense that I just don't think it's true that we're sort of riding on the waves of history. And I don't think that the data bears that out either because it's perfectly possible for these graphs to just descend through the floor and for us to see the dissolution of America as we know it today. That's, perfect, that's perfectly possible. There is nothing inevitable about us bouncing back from this. Um, and that's a pretty bleak picture unless you understand that the only thing that changed it once before was people choosing to change it. And that's one thing that I love, because you brought up earlier, right, the question about World War II. Sometimes we look at World War II and say, oh, it was the war that changed us, right? It was the war that brought us together. That's an easy narrative, because what it does is it outsources our responsibility to an event outside of our control. And many, many people wanted to do this with COVID. We were giving book talks during COVID, and we got this question asked all the time, oh, is this the pandemic? Is this the thing that's going to bring us back together? And my answer was, this is the thing that's going to do to us exactly what we want it to do to us. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we all thought, oh, look at how we're all turning toward our neighbors. This is going to be the thing that finally reminds us that we all have to be in this together. And did that happen? The exact opposite happened. It happened for a little bit. And then we reverted to the exact same trajectory that we were already on and deepened the curve, right? And so I don't think that there's anything inevitable about either an outside shock changing us or some preordained course of you know, history pinging back and forth between two poles. I think the real story here is that we choose. Uh, we choose the future, both in terms of our own choices, individual choices. How do I choose social, to use social media? Every day, every minute, that's a choice I make, whether I use that forum to bring people together or whether I use it to divide. I, me alone. But there's also a choice that we make as a society. As a society, do we choose to regulate these social media empires in such a way that we force them to do the right thing? Or, as, or collectively, do we choose to take our hands off the wheel and say, well, they're going to do what they're going to do? There are individual and collective choices that drive this story. We believe that the data shows that clearly because during the progressive era, there was no external shock. There was nothing that made it inevitable that this was going to go up. Remember I said all of the, all of the cultural commentators at the, at the time thought that it was all going to come unglued, and it didn't. And that was kind of a shock to everyone. And so I really think that this is a challenging read on history, but also an inspiring one because it means that we can change it. We did it once before and we can do it again. And with that, we want to open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, I think we have a microphone, actually. Um, Coming up. Uh, but you know, since you have your hands up, um, you'll go first. We can probably hear you. Yeah, but it's for the. Oh, for the. Yep, yep. For well, the for the live stream. Recording, too. Yep. Do you want to come up, sir? Yeah, I don't think that's on.
I, I can just project. Um, so thank, thank you so much, y'all, for uh, doing this. Um, you said that evangelical Protestants started the progressive movement. Um, what role do you think declining religiousness plays in America performing poorly on these metrics? I didn't hear the, uh, the key part. What role yeah, do you think so, What religion? Uh, so de declining religiousness. Oh, yeah. So, so to be clear, it wasn't necessarily that evangelical Protestantism started the progressive era. It was that the moral shift that defined progressivism started, those conversations started in religious settings, right? Particularly in theological settings. A preacher, actually, looking at the Bible and saying, we're not living different and actually you know we actually see that happening today in evangelical protestantism today there is literally a pitched battle for the future of that faith going on right now um, and we don't know what which side is going to win there are voices within evangelical protestantism saying this is not the religion that christ wants us to live and there are others that are saying yes it is um, and we don't know which one's going to win and so that wasn't your question, but I do, I do want to say that there is an analogous situation happening, analogous debate happening even within just that one religious setting of, of evangelical Christianity. But the broader question was, you know, how does declining religiosity in general affect this story? And it, it act, it's actually huge because it turns out that religion, whether that's Christian or Hindu or Muslim or whatever it is, turns out to be a huge religious participation not necessarily religious belief, not necessarily religious, you know, study of religious doctrine, but religious participation, showing up at a religious service or a church picnic or at the mosque for an iftar, right? That actually has a huge effect on social capital, social cohesion. A ton of America's social capital, connectedness, community connections, face-to-face -face connections happens in religious settings. And so the more that we abandon those settings, it has this effect of further fraying our social fabric, right? I want to just say a word about that. I agree with everything she said. I, um, together, a long time ago, gosh, we were much younger then. <laughs> uh, well, you, yeah. Um, we worked on a book uh, called American Grace, which was a big, huge tome. Don't necessarily buy it, but it was about religion in America. And one of the things we discovered, and I'm now actually rather proud of the science of this, we showed, I won't try to tell you exactly the science, but we showed that not only are religious people nicer, controlling for everything you like, that is, they're more likely to help old ladies across the street, or more likely to, to pick you up if you fall, they're going to a church supper makes you do that. That is, if, if you increase your involvement in religion, it's not whether you believe in God. It's not even whether you belong to church. It's whether you go to a, crib, a, a, a church supper. Something about that has an almost magical effect of making you more likely to volunteer for the scouts, not a, just religious stuff, more likely to contribute, not just to, you know, in the, in the offering plate, but in secular ways too. So that's the first point. I'm not trying to make, I'm actually not all that religious myself, and I'm certainly not, I'm not even Christian, so it, I, I'm not trying to make a case for evangelical, last thing I want to do is make a case for evangelical Protestantism, but I do want to say there is something in religious community that makes us nicer. That's the first thing I want to say. And the second thing is, there is a connection between the declining um, membership, declining membership in in church, in, in ch go, declining attendance at church suppers is a real fact, and that is part of our problem here. But why is there declining attendance at church membership? Because too many churches have gotten political. It is they, I'm not trying to, I'm, you know, many of my best friends are evangelical Christians, although most of them are leaving evangelical, um, like, like um, uh, Rick, help. Warren. Work Warren. Um, so, church, distancing from church is in part a consequence of this emphasis that we've, that some parts of the religious world are placing on 
you know, self, self-centeredness. Um, and it doesn't, look, it, 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 I want to, we should begin where, where, we should end where Shailen began. It isn't exactly the religion that we're pushing as a key, it's the morality. I don't, you don't have to be religious to be nice. You don't have to be religious to think that you have obligations to other people. That's the crucial thing. But it's true that, you know, religious spaces are spaces of moral formation. And in an increasingly secular society, we have to ask ourselves if we're not going to be in spaces where moral formation is taking place, then where is our moral formation going to come? I think there are some interesting do moral formation in a secular setting. For example, Citizen University, who has created something called Civic Saturdays, a secular analog to the church. They had they listen to sermons about what? American democracy, about what we owe to one another that don't have anything to do with God or any particular religious text, but are all about a moral formation that says our morality is about responsibilities more than rights. Right? And that, I think, is something that we have let slide, and we thought that it was fine to just let it go, but we can see that it's had enormous effects on our society. I, what, we could go on because we really care about this. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, I want to just give an example. The Boy Scouts, were in, uh, Boy Scouts in America were invented in the progressive era. They're one of the classic progressive era institutions. Mm -hmm. Not religious. You know, it's sort of summer camp. And, 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 you know, learning merit badges. Do you even know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Scouts? And learning how to, I learned how to identify birds. I have a merit badge for birdie. But what made me a Scout was the fact that I could say, I pledge allegiance to the flag and, no, sorry, wrong, wrong institution. Um, a Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Come on, give some applause for that. I learned that. I learned that 75 years ago. <laughs> and why am I able to remember it? Because I was being taught morals. Think about that. A scout is trustworthy. Is that that sounds reasonable? Helpful. Not so bad. Friendly. Courteous. Kind. Come on. Well, these are not religious. It's just being decent. Courteous. It's, it's, it's having a we ethic. I want to. I want to admit that um, trustworthy, trustworthy, helpful, courteous, kind, brave, clean. Some might take an issue with a few of those. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay. that's another conversation. But, what I'm trying, what <laughs> I'm trying to say, what we're both trying to say is, values really matter. They can be inculcated in a religious, religious setting. Sometimes religious settings don't inculcate those. Sometimes they inculcate the opposite in the name of doing that. But sometimes even secular organizations, right here in America, not only could, but have inculcated those. You can all see that because I'm able to say that uh, a scout is trustworthy. I'm a really nice guy. Something stuck. At least I'm a decent guy. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. You want to come up and... Thank you for the wonderful speech. Uh, I have a question for two of you that uh, uh, in your, your book, you mentioned like uh, the individualism and the community, but my, my question is more about the professionalism and the community, because uh, you just mentioned about moral change and uh, moral change and uh, the social capital, like Professor Putin had mentioned, uh, but uh, some, uh, some political scientists, may, though they are not talking about the American situation, but they try to argue that uh, too much community power will uh, make the, our bureaucracy, our officials think too much about community instead of think about profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, some others also argue about that uh, the more social engagement probably would not lead us to the right uh, common value, like mm -hmm. Professor just mentioned about, mm -hmm. uh, because some research has already proved that we have, uh, we are experiencing uh, community level politicization. So they are worried about that uh, the more social engagement in today would lead to a polar polarized uh, mm -hmm. uh, common sense. So do, my question is, do we need to worry about these two situations? If we do, how could we fix this? So, so yeah, great question. And, and one thing to note is that not all community is created equal, right? Not all community connection 
is of the same flavor, let's say, right? And Bob, in his book, Bowling Alone, made a key differentiation between a couple of different types of social engagement called bridging and bonding. Okay, bonding is where we have connections with people who are just like us, and that's it. But then bridging is when we make connections with people who are unlike us, right? And too much bonding, capital, has some pretty dark phenomena associated with it. I don't know, things like the KKK or the Proud Boys or you name it, right? That's bonding capital to the exclusion of everything else. Bonding social capital, bonding social connection. So, so really what, what we need to understand is the importance of bridging social connection, right? And that is something that is becoming increasingly more difficult because of the algorithms that we face on social media, because of the fact that our, our communities are incredibly geographically sorted, right? That it's, it's hard to walk down the street in your neighborhood and see somebody who doesn't look like you anymore. It's hard to attend a church and see somebody that doesn't look like you, right? And so one thing that was true, though, of the progressive, or of the Gilded Age was that that was very much the same. Jane Addams didn't just walk down the street and meet new immigrants to America. She knew that she didn't understand the new people that were coming to this country. And she left her elitist neighborhood and went to where she could find the people who everyone said were ruining America and try to learn for herself who they were and what they were about. And as a result of that, she brought the Settlement House Movement to America. And the Settlement House Movement can be shown as one of the key drivers of much of the major legislative change that happened during the progressive era. And that wasn't something that was about legislation. It was about human connection across lines of difference. And so if there's one thing that you could do today when you leave this talk in order to be part of the upswing rather than part of the downturn is to go and figure out how you're gonna develop a relationship with someone who does not look like you. Or Whether believe it's like you. across lines of race, across lines of gender, across lines of sexual preference, across lines of ethnicity, you name it, right? We have to do the work to make those connections because the world is making it increasingly harder to do so. So we have to double down on our efforts to make those connections across lines of difference. And so you're right, we do have to be worried that more, more community, more community isn't always better. It's, it's making sure that we are creating community in a mass multicultural democracy. We have to make our community across those lines of difference. And there's, there are incredible movements afoot in America right now who are doing just this sort of thing. Living room conversations, braver angels. There, there are literally hundreds of organizations that have sprung up locally in order to bring people into the same space who otherwise would not be in the same space and help them have hard conversations and help them have, you know, relationship forming conversations. Do something like that and you will be on the right side of history. That's how it happened before and that's how it's gonna happen again. Uh, it's a fitting place to end. Um, there are books for sale for the next half hour back there if you guys wanna pick it up. I wanna thank our two speakers today for coming to the Library of Congress. Uh, we enjoyed the talk and we enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I don't think we've lost the I don't think we've lost a half step, I think we're <laughs>